Veganic farming and gardening. A lot of people are getting into veganic gardening and farming because it's so hard to find veganically grown food. Veganically grown gardens and farms have no pesticides, no artificial or chemical fertilizers, no genetically modified organisms, and also no manure is used, no animal byproducts, and no animal exploitation. Veganic is livestock free, so manure or animal, animal parts, bones, blood, feathers, bodies, are not used as fertilizer. And in fact, a lot of people are getting interested in livestock free or veganic gardening and farming because there are some problems with manures. One is that they can be contaminated with herbicide and antibiotics. The other is nitrogen leaching into the groundwater. And finally, manure used to fertilize vegetable plants can cause human pathogens such as E. coli and salmonella. So a lot of good reasons to think about farming and gardening without manure if possible. Veganic gardening works with nature to mimic natural plant ecosystems. There are three main components to this kind of veganic gardening and farming. The first is reduced tillage. In other words, keeping the soil covered as much as possible throughout the entire growing season. The second is increased plant diversity, not a monoculture of one or two plants, but as many different varieties and types of plants as possible. And the third and most important is regular additions of plant residues, again throughout the season, to maintain natural soil fertility cycles. Increased plant diversity, regular additions of plant residues, and keeping the soil cover promotes a healthy soil and rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is this area that you can see on the slide right now between the main root and those tiny little fragile root hairs that extend into the soil and interact with the soil food web or all the little microorganisms that are living in the soil associated with the root. You can see that these little root hairs are very fragile looking and, and in fact are, are quite easily disturbed. So this is where all of the microorganisms that help the plant take up nutrients when, when uh, plant residues are decomposed. This is where they all live in this, this area. Some of those microorganisms you can see up on the screen now are, are shredders like composting beetles and earthworms and decomposers of smaller particles of plant residue, the bacteria and fungi, actinomycetes and protozoa. These are all collectively what we call the soil food web. To create a healthy rhizosphere and healthy soil food web, we need to continually or regularly add plant residues. And there are many different ways to do this. This is the most simple, basically do nothing approach, which is to let the natural environment do it. These are dung beetles composting antelope manure in a native prairie. But most of us want to be a little more involved and engaged in adding residues to our gardens. We don't all live in natural prairies or natural forest systems, unfortunately. So composting is one of the ways that we humans do this. And there are many, many different ways to compost and many different composting bins that you can use. Worm bins can be used outside and inside if you have a really small area, a small garden, and live in an urban situation. The main difference between all of the composting methods is that they are either aerobic or anaerobic. And aerobic means that composting is done with oxygen. Anaerobic means that no oxygen is allowed into the system. Most of my experience is with aerobic composting, 
and I'm a little nervous about anaerobic composting because in anaerobic or no oxygen situations sometimes biochemicals can be released that are toxic to young seedlings or germinating plants so that would be my only caution with uh, anaerobic composting. Veganic gardening composting means that you don't add meat, fats, or bones to your composting pile. General instructions for composting are to mix the higher nitrogen and lower nitrogen or higher carbon materials together. And in general, brown and dry means low nitrogen, high carbon, and green and succulent means higher nitrogen, lower carbon. So you want a mix of the carbon and nitrogen materials. In general, the rule is two browns for one green. So a little more high carbon material than high nitrogen material. I have to tell you that I break this rule on a regular basis uh, because I'm really cautious with the way I have composted and uh, used, uh, used very aerobic lots of oxygen methods for my composting. And so I tend to use a little more green material than, uh, than brown material. But what do we mean by green material? We need, mean things like chick, chicken, kitchen scraps, garden scraps, grass cuttings, and fresh green plants. Brown would be leaves and straw and anything that is less succulent dried out. A good way in an urban situation to get a good compost pile going is to use a leaf bin. Here's a very nicely aerated leaf bin with chicken wire all the way around so that oxygen's getting in and we're creating here composted leaves or leaf mold. A neat way to turn this pile is to just pick up the bin, move it, and shovel or uh, rake all the leaves back in so that what was on the bottom is now on the top. You can do this in an even smaller situation by getting leaves that have already started that decomposition process, leaf mold, and putting them in a plastic bag in which you punch a whole bunch of holes so that you'll get some good air. Store it in a shady warm spot and by next year you should have leaves rotted down into a pretty nice compost. Another way to easily turn this is to go to your shady warm spot and take the bags and just shake them and again turn them upside down so that what's been on the bottom will now be on the top and get a little more aeration. Sheet composting or mulching is another great way of composting in your garden or right in place. This is basically a surface application of materials. Grass clippings or hay work really well uh, with this kind of uh, this kind of composting. It's basically mulch becoming compost. Dead mulch, what I call dead mulch to to uh, distinguish dead mulch from living mulch, which we'll talk about in a little minute bit, is uh, usually things like straw and leaves. Uh, hay can be considered a dead mulch too, and basically these things bark and pine needles are laid on the surface and uh, um, allowed to decompose. They can be tilled into the soil, but remember that you want to be real cautious in that case because dead mulches that are high carbon materials, lots of brown and dry, will tie up nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil in the short term if tilled into the soil. Interestingly enough, bark and pine needles and straw brown dry leaves don't seem to immobilize or tie up nitrogen and phosphorus so much if they're left on the surface. It's only when they're integrated down into that uh, rhizosphere zone, that zone where the soil food web's doing all their work, that they uh, are taken up by the soil microorganisms and then, uh, then uh, nitrogen and phosphorus is tied up as the soil microorganisms try to break them down. So here's some work I did looking at the nutrient content of particular materials that can be utilized in your garden or on your farm. 
This is the pH, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the big three nutrients that plants need in the different materials. So here we have composted wood bark materials and uh, they're at the top and you can see that they're low in nitrogen and phosphorus and they also have a low pH. And this is kind of a, a neat thing to know if you're working with a soil that has a high pH, adding composted wood bark will help you slowly over time bring the pH down. On the other hand, if you already have a low pH, that's something you want to think about because composted wood bark can continue the process of bringing a soil pH lower and lower. The next materials uh, on this list are composted wood bark and human waste or humanure. And as you can see, when you add the human manure, you get a, a much higher nitrogen and phosphorus. pHs are still relatively low in these uh, composted wood bark hu humanure mixes. Mushroom compost has a really high uh, pH uh, and high nutrients. A lot of mushroom compost is, uh, has animal manure in it, so you have to ask about that. Uh, many don't. Uh, but a lot uh, do, so ask what's in the mushroom compost or what, in other words, the mushrooms have been grown on. Look at grass clippings available to almost all of us anywhere we are. Grass clippings are almost a perfect little fertilizer. It's got a nice uh, pH right in the range of where plants want to be, about 6.6, .6. a good level of uh, nitrogen, almost 2% nitrogen, and uh, moderate levels of phosphorus and potassium. The one thing about lawns that you have to be concerned about grass clippings is that never, never use grass clippings from lawns that have been sprayed with herbicide because the herbicide can be taken up by the grass plants and then released into the soil as they decompose in your garden, affecting your garden plants. In fact, I've seen uh, just terribly distorted garden plants and very unhappy gardeners with uh, herbicide that has come from grass clippings. Alfalfa pellets or alfalfa meal can be utilized either on the surface or tilled directly in. Probably tilling directly in uh, is, is a little bit better uh, for getting the nitrogen phosphorus and potassium in alfalfa pellets right to the plant roots and into a plant available form as quickly as possible. These are uh, alfalfa pellets that are being used in a certified veganic tomato growing operation in Arizona. There are a whole bunch of other supplementary products for veganic gardens and farms. Lime and ash both increase the pH add a little bit of calcium, but definitely increase the pH if you have a low pH soil. Soybean, cottonseed meal, and coffee grounds all add nitrogen. In an urban situation, I've always found uh, coffee grounds are particularly easy to get a hold of. Kelp or seaweed add potassium uh, as well as uh, micronutrients and plant growth regulators or the things that, uh, that affect plant growth. One of the keys to uh, the success of a garden I grew on an island in British Columbia was uh, was collecting seaweed. There's a picture of me right there doing that and uh, composting it and adding it directly to the garden. Rock dust and granite meal are good phosphorus sources. Gypsum is a way of adding calcium without increasing the pH. And then you can also make plant-based compost teas or fermented plant extracts. This is a fermented plant extract of nettles and nettles are a wonderful wonderful source of nitrogen and there's some scientific evidence that they can make nitrogen more available to plant roots in the soil if they're, uh, if they're added to the soil. So um, nettles tea can be made by getting a 30 gallon garbage can, adding, filling it all the way to the top with nettles filling it with uh, warm water and then uh, letting it basically ferment for a couple of days at about 55 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. There's some evidence that some 
fermented plant extracts can actually help to suppress disease uh, in some cases. On the other hand, remember that if you have a whole bunch of apple scab on your apples or you already have a lot of disease on your plants, that uh, fermented plant extracts are probably not going to help you get rid of it. They tend to be more preventative in nature. So we talked about dead mulches, which are basically a surface applied residue. Now I want to talk about living mulches. Living mulches are a residue that is left on the surface as well. So you have above ground plant residue, but you also have below ground plant residue in that there are roots that every time you mow are losing some of their, their root material or sloughing off their roots into the soil around plants. So uh, living mulches give you the benefit above, of above and below ground biomass or soil organic matter addition. So living mulch is basically something that's planted with the crop, grown at the same time that the crop's growing, and you keep it mowed between the crop rows. In fact, uh, this is a picture of my first uh, foray into living mulches when I was a young farmer in my uh, early 20s, uh, my first farm that I was farming by myself, and I had put in all these tomato steaks, and I could not figure out how to get the uh, cultivating tractor over the tomato steaks and cultivating in between the rows. So I just let the weeds grow up and mowed them and found out that this was a wonderful management system for weeds and for um, for soil fertility and uh, basically never went back to uh, cultivation. In fact, I moved on in my living mulch experiments and uh, modified the system more and more so that I could turn it into a, as much as possible a closed cycling soil fertility system. So here's a picture of legume living mulches on my farm uh, in Montana. And legumes, of course, are nitrogen fixers. So they will fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and hold it in their roots and thus use less nitrogen. And when they are mowed or tilled back into the soil, will release that nitrogen into the soil. So this is, uh, actually, I think this is a picture of Medic, uh, which I used earlier on and uh, then moved almost exclusively to using different clovers, which we'll talk about here in a minute. There's some good research out the last few years that indicate that legumes are much more important in rotations than we might have realized, especially for building soil organic matter levels. This researcher was looking at uh, a 10-year period of uh, rotation of different crops and uh, he found that when using nitrogen fixing legumes in rotations less than 25 percent of the time, less than one every four years, that over the 10-year period there was a decrease in soil organic matter levels. So I'm a big fan of adding legumes. Uh, in fact, they're in my rotation 100 percent of the time. Uh, rather than relying heavily on higher carbon grasses, which again we'll talk about in a little bit. The other neat thing about living mulch is that some scientists have found that they suppress diseases. So here's a leguminous understory crop that was able to suppress a, a fusarium wilt or a, a root rot in, uh, in an orchard system. Cover crops and green manures are basically the same as living mulches, except that instead of growing with the crop, cover crops and green manures are usually tilled into the soil before the crop is planted or after the crop is planted. Perennials can be used for green manures and uh, cover crops. People often use a mixture of ryegrass and hairy vetch, or grasses and legumes. Hairy vetch is a nitrogen-fixing legume. And this mix of grass and legume is a really good 
gives you a good balance of nitrogen and carbon. Mixes of grass and, and uh, legumes are also used because they uh, seem to be in combination some of the better ways of suppressing disease. They fill up that niche better than one alone would do and, and hence don't leave any room for weeds to get established and germinate. Again though, I'm a fan of legumes and legumes provide the best levels of nitrogen when mowed or tilled into the soil and often as an organic uh, farmer that's what is most limiting for us when we try to uh, when we try to farm uh, organically. So I'm always trying to figure out how to get nitrogen into the soil. And the perennial clovers are white clover, all-site clover, and subterranean clover. There's a whole bunch of other clovers. Uh, these perennials are the ones that are used most uh, uh, most for cover crops and for green manures. You can also use um, annual clovers. I'll talk about those in a sec. Uh, crimson clover is one of them shown here. Annuals, the reason to use are because that they are just much easier to manage in small garden areas. They don't get out of control. Buckwheat is an annual that can be used in uh, in small spaces. The nice thing about buckwheat is then when, when you let it grow and get up just to flowering, it brings up phosphorus from deep areas in the soil, so it's considered a a phosphorus accumulator. A legume Austrian field peas overwinter in warm climates uh, and even cooler climates like Montana. I um, forgot to mention that buckwheat will uh, will be killed as soon as temperatures glow, go below freezing. I said that I would talk about some of the uh, annual clovers that are nitrogen fixers and one of my favorites that I've used a lot is Bursium clover. It winter kills in colder climates although I have to say that in uh, warmer climates uh, it doesn't winter kill at all so uh, you have to be careful not to let it go to seed uh, and you may have to actually till it in to kill it. Crimson clover is another annual clover that I used in uh, in British Columbia in a maritime climate where uh, though it did get cold and below freezing in the winter the crimson clover that I planted very late in the fall uh, towards the end of October uh, germinated nicely got to be about uh, an inch two inches tall and uh, uh, lived right over the winter and started growing in the spring. This is a uh, a series of photographs of how I utilized it uh, in this maritime climate in British Columbia. Again, I seeded it in the fall. It uh, started growing uh, quite luxuriously, flowered, and was a wonderful pollen source for uh, uh, beneficial insects in the spring with its beautiful tall red flowers. And uh, then it died and uh, well, I went to seed first and then died and I mowed it back. I had already planted potatoes into it uh, as it was starting to die. I mowed it and you can see the potatoes starting to come up and then as I kept watering the potatoes and they kept growing, the seeds that had, uh, had gone to seed germinated in July for free and I got a second cover crop or green manure uh, that turned into a living mulch out of uh, out of my crimson clover. So in a warm climate, uh, if you manage it properly, uh, it can be kind of a a neat uh, a neat uh, living mulch and green manure. Brassicas or plants in the mustard family can also be used as a green manure. Rape and daikon radish are two examples. There's a lot of great evidence that brassicas, plants in the mustard family, inhibit weed seed germination and in fact suppress diseases such as root rots. The uh, really nice thing by the way about daikon radish is that it really provides a huge amount of below ground biomass so if you have a heavy soil and want to break it up, daikon radish is a good, 
a good possibility. So we've looked at all of the different materials, or many of the different materials that can be added to the soil. Again, we want to remember that you want to have a good balance of carbon and nitrogen residues, and you want to maintain a good carbon to nitrogen ratio. So green and succulent plant residues have higher nitrogen. Brown and dry residues have lower nitrogen and, and higher carbon. Just like when we were talking about this with composting, when you think about green manures, same important point. High carbon materials can temporarily steal nitrogen from crops as microorganisms break them down. It's temporary, but it can sometimes last most of your growing season and your plants will then look nutrient deficient. So let's look in a little bit more detail about how plant residues become a fertilizer. This is maybe uh, a little more biochemistry than most people want here. This is the biochemical pathways of decomposition. And if you look carefully, you'll see that both pathways get to the same place. No matter what we add, it breaks down into humic acid or humus. Humus is, as you all probably know, the foundation of soil organic matter, or the skeletal framework of soil organic matter, the place where microorganisms want to, want to live and what provides a good food source for them. So both residues types break down to humus, but with different micro, microorganisms and different nutrient release rates. So green and succulent or what I call the candy bar pathway, breaks down rapidly and with a more bacterial dominated soil food web. Whereas brown and dry, or what I call the whole wheat bread pathway, breaks down a little more slowly with more of a fungal dominated soil food web involved. So in general, green and succulent materials break down faster, brown and dry materials break down more slowly, all get to the same pathway. You can see though why you'd want to add a diversity of those materials because you have different micro microorganisms associated with the breakdown of different materials. So to keep a healthy, diverse soil food web, add different kinds of residues. Just like with living mulches, green manures suppress disease. This is a, a slide that shows the results of some research done in Colorado. Whoops, I'm sorry, in Idaho actually with potatoes. And it compares leaving the soil bare or uncovered, fallow, with using a couple of different green manures. One is a legume, pea. Another is a mustard family, or brassica, canola, and the third is a grass, Sudan grass. And in this particular case, with verticillium wilt of potato, Sudan grass as a green manure and tilled in caused the uh, best weed, or excuse me, the best disease suppression, at least of verticillium. Tillage also affects disease suppression. In undisturbed forest soils, there can be as much as 82% natural suppression of root rot diseases. On the other hand, the more we manage the soils, the more we cultivate them up to soils that are tilled in the spring and then cultivated for weeds all summer, we get down to as little as 7% natural disease suppression. So we can add green manures, we can add living mulches to help suppress diseases, but another really important thing is to reduce tillage as much as possible. So let me show you a case study of how to put all these principles together into a farming system. This is a case study of what I did for the first uh, 10 to 13 years on my farm using living mulches. So the goal was to keep the soil covered spring, summer, winter, and fall. And you can see I've got uh, a decomposing brown residue in my uh, 
tomatoes there and the living mulches are still green uh, going from fall into winter. In the spring I would come in with very light tillage making sure that I leave lots of plant residue left on the soil. In fact, my neighbors would drive by and say, uh, when are you going to decompose that, uh, that soil? Then in the spring, I would come in with light tillage and make sure that there was lots of plant residue left on the surface. You can see that there's quite a bit of uh, plant material left on the surface of that soil. In fact, my neighbors would drive by and say, well, when are you going to get that soil ready for planting? And I'd say, well, I have already. And they'd say, hmm, doesn't look at it. Doesn't look like it at all. Doesn't look very clean yet. And uh, that's the way I wanted it. Then I'd go through and make beds and the plant residue that had been on the surface of the soil was mounded up and pushed into the beds and would then slowly decompose all season, adding a food source for the soil food web and also being a slow decomposition fertilizer for my plants all season. Then I would seed new cover between the rows in the spring after making the beds. Uh, and in this case I use clover seed. As you can see, that kind of light tan seed is all the clover seed on the uh, soil surface in between the crop rows, in between the beds. And if you look closely, you see some green plants already coming up, and there they are, three-leafed clovers. These are recruits from the previous season's living mulch already regrowing because I had uh, not beat the soil up too much when I tilled. And in fact, you see that uh, those roots, as many weeds do, have uh, turned into new plants. So as little time as possible for the soil to be bare without plants and without roots. The new living mulch that I seeded would already be well established by the time we planted our our summer crops like tomatoes and uh, and peppers. By the time we're harvesting broccoli in uh, late spring the living mulch, as you see, is already up and flowering. In this case, it looks like it was white clover or an, al or an alcite clover. Then the mature living mulch is kept mowed monthly so that I'm regularly applying surface applied residue and uh, making sure that the soil food web doesn't uh, go hungry or doesn't feel like uh, we feel in thanks on a Thanksgiving after a Thanksgiving dinner where you get a whole bunch of food all at once and then you feel sluggish. Uh, that's a little bit the way soil microorganisms feel after a uh, green manure crop is tilled in. They get a whole bunch of residue all at once and, uh, and they're a little sluggish for a bit. This regularly applied residue is more a way of mimicking a natural system. So we saw unbelievable benefits from our living mulch system over uh, the first uh, 10 to 13 years. The first was that we saw a balanced supply of all the nutrients that plant require. The second was uh, improved yield and quality. We were able to grow just wonderful quality of tomatoes and uh, uh, grew about 50,000 pounds of tomatoes uh, per acre. Improved cold tolerance was another added benefit. These are red peppers that are being harvested after uh, temperatures the previous night in the uh, middle to low 20s. Living mulches also provide habitat for beneficial insects right there where your crop plant is. This is a photo of a yellow sweet clover that was allowed to uh, go to seed from the previous year. It was planted the previous year uh, and then we didn't till it under. We left a, a couple of strips so that we would have these flowers as an early spring pollen and nectar source for uh, beneficial insects. And what we found over time is that we got new 
beneficial insects moving in. About five years into this system, we began to see this predaceous stink bug uh, that we'd not seen before, and here he is taking out a Colorado potato beetle larva. We also found that the living mulch was providing habitat for pollinators for insects that would help us pollinate. And we did a couple studies and found that, yep, as a result, we were getting increased fruit set, even on crops like tomatoes that uh, are mostly self-pollinated. Added insects uh, allowed uh, greater, greater fruit set. And then the most exciting thing that was over the long term adding regular additions of clover mulch, so to speak, or this living mulch, increased our soil fertility. So from 1993 to about 1999, we increased soil organic matter uh, basically 2% from 3.5 to 5.7. We saw huge increases in all of the nutrients that plants need, and in fact, by 1999, our nitrogen levels were getting to be what some people would call excessive. They were just a little high. So we started experimenting. I should tell you that I was not a veganic farmer, uh, though I was a vegetarian, uh, in the early years. And from 1993 to 1999, we used manure. But we saw how high our nitrogen levels were, and we thought, well, maybe we can get away with just using the living mulch system and not using any manure. So, from 1999 to 2003 and 2006, you see our soil organic matter level stayed about the same. Uh, it went down a little teeny bit, but stayed about the same. All the uh, other nutrient levels uh, stayed uh, quite high, but we did see a drop in nitrogen levels when we stopped adding manure. Uh, still, however, though, we were at uh, 33 to 44 uh, percent, or parts per million, nitrate nitrogen, which is plenty to provide a good crop of, uh, a good commercial crop of almost any vegetable that you uh, want. Uh, with lower levels, you could provide a good garden, backyard level, uh, but we were still getting very, very high yields on tomatoes and peppers with uh, these lower nitrogen levels. We found with some other research that living mulch has different nutrients and different carbon to nitrogen ratios at different times of the year. And this is important to know because remember that high carbon to nitrogen ratio materials greater than, say, 30 to 50 CN ratio, carbon to nitrogen ratio, can cause that temporary unavailability of nitrogen and phosphorus. A couple of interesting things we saw that I've not really looked at more closely and probably should is that, uh, especially among micronutrients, things like iron, there were uh, very different levels at different times of the year. Look at that iron level. Uh, 503 parts per million early in the spring and uh, went down to uh, less than 200 in uh, later in the year. So I think this is a, an area that could be looked at um, with much more research is using plant material at different times of the season when it's more mature and less mature to get different kinds of nutrients. And again is another case for the argument that, uh, another point for the argument that you want to add residue continuously and not at just one time of the year. So I showed you what we did for the first 10 to 13 years. Now I'm going to show you what, uh, what I did for the last uh, six or seven years. We were really happy with uh, our reduced tillage and uh, the sliving mulch system adding plants as our, our main fertility, and we decided that uh, we wanted to reduce tillage as much as possible. So we moved to a new field, uh, did some minor tillage of a 50-year-old 50 50 pasture, and uh, 
and then we planted uh, a cover crop, a permanent cover crop of red clover, and uh, the following year decided that we would uh, we would plant our vegetables right into the uh, red clover with very minimum tillage and we tried some no tillage where we just burned the clover with a propane uh, a burner and um, we left the row middles as permanent untilled areas that uh, were never tilled. So uh, this experiment uh, was done in uh, uh, the no-till experiment was done in about, I think 2006 is when we did that. We tried no-till Brussels sprouts. In the top left corner is just planting the transplants into the uh, burned burned area. And you can see that uh, we definitely didn't kill that clover. It's already starting to come back. And uh, below you see it's really coming up. And off to the right, you see that the Brussels sprouts, which are a very weedy crop in and of themselves, a very competitive crop, uh, were having trouble competing uh, early on with the uh, with the red clover. In fact, um, we had a little ceremony out in the field for the ascension of the Brussels sprouts when they finally got to be taller than the red clover. Red clover was probably not the best choice for a no-till living mulch growing right in with the uh, the crop no-till. Uh, it was a wonderful choice for a permanent cover in between the rows, but it was better suited to the uh, minimum till option. Uh, I don't have time to talk too much about this experiment, but uh, there are a number of videos and uh, uh, write-ups on this experiment at my website www.veganicpermaculture.com. In summary, then, what I learned over the last uh, 17 to 20 years of using living mulches and green manures, but particularly uh, living mulches in uh, a mainly plant-based soil fertility system, is that you want to apply plant residues throughout the season, not just in the spring, not just in the fall, but throughout the season, and you want to mix higher and lower carbon and nitrogen ratio materials. So that's the case study at my farm. How about if you live in the city? Can you use plant residue as a fertilizer in the city? Absolutely. You've got that wonderful lawn grass clippings out there that you can transform to a garden. And here's some photos of gardens that have sprung up by getting rid of lawn. So, many ways to remove lawn. Uh, this is one of the most common ways, is to just come in with uh, digging and lots of people. And uh, you can uh, till that in or actually remove the sod. I am not a fan of removing sod, and I'll tell you why here in a little bit when we look at some other alternatives. But uh, So you basically remove the sod, you make raised beds, then you add leaves to uh, to uh, the, the beds, cover the beds. Uh, but remember, you've already gotten rid of this wonderful fertilizer. And uh, people do that because sometimes grass can come back and be a, a rather aggressive weed in a garden. It doesn't want to die, so to speak, despite all the water and fertilizers that we seem to put into it uh, to keep them green. When you try to kill it, grass uh, grass hangs in there. But remember, grass clippings provided that lovely fertilizer with that wonderful nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium ratio of 1.9, 0 0.3, and 0 0.8. So how do we take advantage of that without getting rid of it? How do we use the grass as a fertilizer? Well, there are many ways to set the lawn back. Here we have a cover. Uh, called eco cover. This photograph is uh, on my farm in Montana where I was experimenting with uh, uh, paper covers trying to get away from my black plastic mulch for uh, tomatoes and peppers in a cold climate. Uh, you can see that we're putting it down and there's still snow in the hills behind, uh, behind where we are getting ready in the spring.
So the eco cover was uh, can be placed right over sod and uh, lawn and used to uh, to um, kill it back with a mulch. We also experimented with vinegar herbicides and uh, this was a very high potency vinegar or a high concentration of acetic acid so 25 percent acetic acid and it did turn the lawn basically uh, white brown for about two weeks but then the grass came back so uh, vinegar herbicide utilized with some other kind of mulch could be a very good way of setting the lawn back. I want to remind you that uh, just regular old vinegar is probably not going to do this. Vinegar that you buy in the store is about 5% vinegar, or excuse me, 5% acetic acid. You can use cardboard mulch to remove lawn and uh, that when you place it right over the, the the lawn and the grass clippings then can be used as as nutrients as the grass decomposes. Uh, usually you have to leave this on for um, most of the season to get this benefit and, and uh, if you, you take it off too soon the grass is going to come right back. Uh, you can use straw over the, uh, the cardboard. You can also use straw alone by itself. Uh, this is the root Ruth Stout method with a thick hay mulch and when I say thick we mean you know 8 to 10 inches up to 2 foot thick to uh, set back the, uh, the grass or in this case a pasture. Lasagna gardening is a way of mulching over lawn or mulching over uh, a pasture that then is raised up so you add all kinds of other materials, a layer of compost, cardboard, leaf mold, etc. to um, to get your mulch high enough that that grass is not going to be able to grow back. Another exciting way of thinking about a garden is to think of it in terms of mimicking a natural forest system, the forest garden. And in a forest garden, you think three-dimensional. You have seven or several layers, in this case seven layers, of different heights of plants starting with small herbaceous plants, ground covers, up to root crops and vegetable crops and berry shrubs and fruit trees of mid and tall sizes. So again, even with your your vegetable crops that are annuals, you can trellis them and make them grow in three dimensions. The neat thing about a forest garden is you utilize not only different heights but different light levels. So you can utilize all kinds of different shade tolerant annual edibles and here's a lift, list of some of the more shade toler tolerant annuals that you can put in a forest garden. In a forest garden you also want to add flowers and herbs and wild spaces to create habitat for our pollinator and uh, beneficial insects and birds. All of our free ecosystem providers that uh, help us do the job of managing insects and and diseases. One of the things I've noticed over the years of using mainly plant residues uh, for fertilizers is that they decompose a little more slowly and hence uh, the soil is, uh, is a little cooler um, in the spring they decompose even more slowly and sometimes with plant residues you can be a little later to a farmers market with your crop because you you uh, you just don't have the heat units. Uh, so one of the things that can really help is to extend the season with uh, with reme, which is in the top left, uh, plastic, and uh, you can also make cold frames. I used reme mainly on my farm. I really like the breathability of the reme. It's a uh, polyspun uh, uh, cotton fabric as opposed to plastic. And then one of the best ways to of course to extend your veganic garden is to move indoors and do sprouting and lots of information about sprouting. I'm just throwing a slide in to remind us. 
So, in conclusion, basically, it takes some careful planning, but veganic farming and gardening can be done relatively easily, and plant-based fertilization is a wonderful way to provide food for your family and yourself, and as a farmer, it certainly can be done. Again, you, uh, you want to plan carefully. For more information about veganic gardening and, and uh, veganic farming, you can go to www.goveganic.net and uh, there's my website www.veganicpermaculture.com Thank you.